Hello and welcome to this webinar. Today I'm going to be talking about OAEs or otoacoustic emissions and their use in diagnostic audiology. What I'll be covering today in this webinar will provide you with an overview of the patients that would benefit from OAE testing, how and why it's important to use different protocols or settings for different patients, test environments or test outcomes, and also how you can correctly analyse your OAE measurements. While I'll mainly be focusing on DPOEs for this talk, or distortion product otoacoustic emissions, there is an overlap that you can also apply to transient OAEs or TEOAEs. My name is Jessica Araway Ramos and I am an audiologist from Australia. I'm now working as the clinical product manager for the Intraacoustics ABR and OAE product portfolio. I'm really excited to be able to give this webinar today through the Intraacoustics Academy. And if you haven't already visited the Academy website, I encourage you to do so. I know there are lots of webinars and training videos on this topic of OAEs, as well as other areas in audiology, such as evoke potentials, tympanometry, balance, and hearing aid fitting. Now let's look at some learning objectives for this webinar today. So at the end of the course, you should be able to identify the appropriate settings to create diagnostic DPOE test protocols. You'll be able to analyze and categorize diagnostic DPOE test results into one of three categories. And you'll also be able to list the patient groups that would benefit from diagnostic OAE testing. And I also hope that by the end of this webinar, you're going to feel more confident in how you can get the most out of your diagnostic OAE equipment for obtaining the best OAE results. And of course, that will lead to a more accurate diagnosis of your patients that you're seeing in clinic. Now, most of the screenshots you'll see throughout the presentation come from the Interacoustics Titan, but you will be able to apply this knowledge to any OAE products that you're currently using in your clinic. Now, I want to start by posing a couple of questions that I'd also like you to consider as I go through this webinar. Firstly, how often are you performing OAE tests where the result is shown as a pass or refer? Now, if we think about this, um, pass refer tests do give us very valuable information, particularly when we're testing children. They're very easy to administer and the results are very easy to read and interpret. But if you're working in diagnostics, then a pass refer test may not always give you enough information to accurately make a conclusion about your patient's cochlear function or their hearing status. And we're going to go into more detail uh, during the webinar about this. The second question is, have you ever adjusted the test protocol provided to you by your manufacturer? And this is something that I'm going to focus a lot of on today in this talk. Um, there are a lot of different settings that can make a huge difference to the outcome of your test. This may mean faster test results or reliable results, being able to test in situations where you may not usually be able to get good results with standard protocols. So knowing when and how to adjust the protocol settings is going to be hugely beneficial in getting the best measurements. And of course, that's going to lead to an easier analysis of your test results and a conclusion about them. Now let's look at some basic anatomy and physiology, as well as some OAE assumptions to make sure we're all on the same page. So here is a diagram of the ear. We have the outer ear with the ear canal and the eardrum, the middle ear and the cochlea. And when we present a sound to the ear, it travels through the ear canal, middle ear, and eventually reaches the cochlea. And this is where the OAEs are generated. So OAEs are the sounds that are generated by the movement of the outer hair cells in a healthy functioning cochlea in response to an external stimulus. When we have a healthy outer ear and middle ear is also required to accurately record these small amplitude sounds, which can vary from around minus 10 dBSPL to positive 30 dBSPL in a healthy functioning cochlea. Now, if we roll out the cochlea and we take a cross section, we can see that the cochlea partitions are there and it's the middle partition, the scalar media that we're most interested in. And here we have a closer up view of the basilar membrane, the tectorial membrane, the auditory nerve, the three rows of outer hair cells, and also the one row of inner hair cells. And it's this shearing movement of the tectorial membrane over the stereocilia of the outer hair cells that causes the outer hair cells to respond to sound. 
And so what's happening is, is they're changing shape um, in order to amplify and propagate those sounds along the basilar membrane, which is triggering an electrical potential, which is sending um, information up to our brain that we hear as sound. And so it's the energy that's created from this shearing movement that is leaking back into the middle ear and further into the ear canal that we can record with a probe. So if there's no outer hair cells or they're extremely damaged, then no OAE is going to be produced. Now let's look at the role that the outer, middle and inner ear play in recording an OAE. If we start with the outer ear or the external canal, this is where the interface is between the probe and the auditory system. It's also where the stimulus delivery occurs and also where we're recording the OAE. So any pathologic or non-pathologic condition is going to affect our recording. So when we're doing our OAE test, we need to be considering things such as, is there a large amount of wax or debris in the ear canal? What's the shape of the ear canal? And we can check that by doing a toscopy before we do our OAE measurement. And we should also make sure that we have a good probe fit for testing. Um, if the probe is not fitted properly in the ear canal, this means that there can be leakage of the OAE um, and it can also let a lot of environmental noise into the recording, which we don't want. Now let's look at the middle ear. And the middle ear actually plays a very big role in our ability to record an OAE measurement. So unlike tests such as audiometry that only require a forward transmission of sound, there's both a forward and a reverse transmission through the middle ear when we do OAE testing. So we have the stimulus that evokes the OAE traveling through the middle ear to reach the cochlea, and we have that OAE that's generated traveling back through the middle ear to the ear canal. Now in general, the middle ear causes up to about a 30 dB loss in OAE energy as it travels from the cochlea to the outer ear, and that's just in a healthy ear. So any middle ear problems are going to have a significant effect on our ability to record an OAE measurement. Therefore, it's going to be really important that we know the status of the middle ear in combination with our diagnostic OAE measurements in order to ensure an accurate analysis. So you need to be considering things such as negative middle ear pressure, any middle ear disorders or a perforation um, of the eardrum when you're performing OAE measurements. So it can be really beneficial if you want to, for example, perform tympanometry or wideband tympanometry or absorbance to get this overview before you do your OAE testing. And finally, let's have a look at the cochlea. And of course, this is where our OAEs are generated. And the outer hair cells in the cochlea, what they're doing is they're basically acting as a preamplifier to increase energy in the cochlea. And the reason they do this is that they enhance our hearing sensitivity and also our frequency selectivity. And so it's this um, energy from the movement of the outer hair cells that leaks back to our outer ear that we can record as an OAE. So if there's no um, outer hair cells or they've been extremely damaged, then we're not going to be able to record an OAE from that ear. Now let's take a look at the two main types of evoked OAEs that are performed in clinics today and how they're generated. Transient evoked otoacoustic emissions are most commonly evoked using a repeated broadband click stimulus, like the one that you can see here on the screen. The recording occurs during the brief intervals between the stimulus presentation that activates a wide area of the basilar membrane. So this is an example here to try and demonstrate what, what is actually happening during the TEOE recording. So what we're doing is we're presenting many, many clicks. So these are our click stimuli here. And in between each presentation of click stimulus, we're recording. So we do a brief recording between every stimulus. And what we're doing is we're presenting the, the click stimulus at different levels and also different polarities. And what that does is it allows us to record the OAE and average out any noise or reflections in the response that are not otoacoustic emissions. So the TEOE equipment is going to use a combination of time windowing, filtering, and also this sequence of stimulus presentation in order to ensure that what we see on our, on our screen when we've done our recording is a response from the cochlea and not from the stimulus or, or other reflections that are coming from the ear.
Here's a diagram of the ear. We have the outer ear where our probe is going to be placed and we have the cochlea there that's rolled out uh, just for this example to make it easier to understand. So we're going to present our broadband stimulus and as each of those frequency components reach their place on the basilar membrane, they're going to generate an OAE in a healthy ear. And those responses, those OAEs are sent back to the probe and we can record those. And what we see here um, is the response waveform of the, the OAE. And typically these responses from the ear averaged alternatively into two response pools that are referred to as A and B buffers. And we do this so that various time and frequency domain correlations can be performed to help us be able to analyze the OAE response. Now, typically we're recording in the range from around two to around 23 milliseconds, and the shorter latencies represent the high frequency region of the cochlea, as you can see there. And while the lower frequency regions are obviously at the longer latencies. Now you can also see here that the response waveform is only shown between uh, four to about 12 and a half milliseconds. And the reason for this is we normally have a blocking period at the beginning of the recording up to around two to four milliseconds. And this to, is to ensure that we're not analyzing early components of the response, which could be from stimulus artifacts. So luckily for us, when we're using our equipment in the clinic, we do see this response waveform on the screen, uh, which is presented in the time domain. But mostly what you'll be looking at when you're analyzing your results is the OAE response in the frequency domain. And typically the response is broken down into half octave bands centered around the main audiometric frequencies, as you can see there. And what we can see on the graph is we've got the amplitude of the OAE response here and the frequencies that are being tested. We have some nice check marks to indicate that those responses have met the detection criteria. And we can also see the signal to noise ratio values as well. Now let's have a look at distortion product OAEs. Now this is a little bit different to TEOEs because we use two pure tone stimuli to evoke the response here. And the pure tones are referred to as F1 or frequency one and F2 frequency two. And it's typically the F2 frequency that we refer to as our test frequency. So for example, here we can see that the F2 is 3000 Hertz and then a fixed ratio is used, usually 1.22 to determine what the F1 frequency will be. So in this case, it's 2460 Hertz. And then what the algorithm does is it's looking for uh, an OAE that's been generated using a mathematical equation of 2F1 minus F2. So if we have a look here, we're presenting these two frequencies, these two pure tones simultaneously. And what ha happens in the cochlea is you have these two traveling waves that overlap and that causes a distortion in the cochlea that's centered around the F2 frequency. And so then we're looking for that OAE, as I just mentioned, at the 2F1 minus F2 place. And there are also other distortions that occur in the cochlea, but it's this one expressed mathematically as 2F1 minus F2 that's usually the largest. And so that's the one that we're analyzing. Now, if we look at our diagram of the ear again, when we place our probe into the ear canal, we're presenting our two pure tone stimuli. And as they reach their place on the basilar membrane, those traveling waves are causing that distortion that we can record back with the probe. And what we see on our test screen is we, we see this response graph here, which shows the frequency spectrum. And we can see both our stimuli, our F1 and our F2. And we can also see our OAE response at the place of 2F1 minus F2. And all these jagged lines down the bottom here, that's, that's, our, that's our noise floor. So that's the noise in the recording. So we can clearly see here that the, the otoacoustic emission is well above the noise floor. So in this case, it's very likely that that is a present or a true OAE response. Uh, luckily for us as clinicians, when we're analyzing our results, we don't need to look at this response graph in so much detail because our results are displayed on a DP gram. And so on our DP gram, what we can see is we've got our frequencies here that we're testing. We have our amplitude of our OAE response. 
we have the noise in the recording and our measured OAEs. And nicely here, we've got some check marks that are indicating to us that the OAE responses have been detected by the algorithm. So we can make some broad generalized statements based on our OAE test results in relationship to audiometric results, but there are some limitations. So firstly, OAEs are generally present in nearly all normal hearing ears. And if we see absent or abnormal OAEs, this is generally an indication that there is a hearing loss or some sort of middle ear pathology present. But an ear with no or reduced OAEs does not necessarily belong to an ear with bad hearing. For example, you may see a patient with a normal audiogram, but they have reduced OAEs at some frequencies. And there are also those patients that have maybe a mild to moderate hearing loss that probably won't have OAEs, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't hear. And finally, an ear with OAEs does not necessarily belong to an ear with normal hearing. And for those of you that are aware of um, disorders such as auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, we know that in these patients, they normally have um, robust and normal looking OAEs, but their hearing isn't actually normal. There are a number of different patient groups that can benefit from OAE testing. And with each patient you see clinically, you can consider how OAE measurement data might assist you in understanding the overall test results more easily and how it might lead to getting the client the best treatment. With OAEs, we can think about how we can give patients more value from these added tests and also how we can get more information to help the client get the best medical treatment. In paediatrics, OAEs can be used in conjunction with other tests to help us form a conclusion about the child's hearing. Now, in 1976, James Jerger and Deborah Hayes coined the term the cross-check principle, and they presented this as a rationale for a test battery approach for the evaluation of children. Now, we know with children that it can be difficult to sometimes get them to do behavioural testing, or they may not even be able to do behavioural testing depending on their age, and so OAEs are going to be a great addition to the test battery in order to determine the child's hearing loss. They're often used in follow-up newborn hearing screening assessments, so for babies that have referred on their newborn hearing screening test, and they're going to be a perfect test for helping in the assessment of auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder versus a sensory neural hearing loss. If we look at some of the um, guidelines, paediatric guidelines, the UK NHSP guidelines for the assessment and management for ANSD in young infants stipulates that the assessment must include OAEs together with ABR and cochlear microphonic testing. So in the UK, they're using OAEs as part of their follow-up assessments in cases where they suspect ANSD for the child. And the JCIH um, 2007 position statement also recommends that OAEs are conducted for any child that's referred from a universal newborn hearing screening for a follow-up audiological assessment. And those are for children from birth to six months of age and also for subsequent evaluations of children from six to 36 months of age. Now, if we look at children and older adults, how could we use OAEs to assess these patients? Well, OAEs can be great, as, as I've just mentioned, as a cross-check, um, and particularly in patients where they're suspected of having a functional hearing loss. So we can use those OAEs to cross-check our audiogram. Does, does the audiogram and the OAE make sense together? We can also use it to differentiate between cochlear and retrocochlear auditory dysfunction. So we just talked a little bit about that with ANSD. So it can help us distinguish between a sensory hearing loss and, an, and a, um, a neural auditory disorder. OAEs are also useful in ototoxicity monitoring. So we know that with ototoxic drugs, these can actually affect the outer hair cell function and damage the outer hair cells. And the OAEs usually detect this cochlear dysfunction long before it's seen on the audiogram. And one of the other great things about OAEs is that it doesn't require that behavioral response. So if you've got a patient that's receiving ototoxic drugs, they're probably not going to feel the best. They may not be up for doing audiometric testing, doing an audiogram. And so these sick patients can un easily undertake these behavioral assessments. 
Um, OAEs are also useful in assessing noise or music-induced hearing loss. Again, OAEs give us that early warning sign of a cochlear dysfunction that we may not see on the audiogram yet. And lastly, for tinnitus patients, OAEs can actually provide an objective confirmation of the cochlear dysfunction in those patients where they may have a normal audiogram, but they're complaining of having tinnitus. Let's have a look at a couple of case examples. So here's one where our patient has a moderate hearing loss and they've got normal tympanometry results in both ears and normal acoustic reflex results. Now, what if we completed our assessment by conducting some OAE testing? We'd probably be a little bit shocked to see that this patient has fairly normal OAEs there at all frequencies, but they have a moderate hearing loss. So something's not right here, something's wrong. And this could be an example where the patient has a functional hearing loss, where they're trying to fake their hearing loss for some reason. And the OAE test can give us some, some very good information as to whether that hearing loss is true or not. Um, here's an example that I found on the internet, and this is of a tinnitus patient, a 12-year-old boy who had normal audiometry results, normal tympanograms, but was complaining of tinnitus in the left ear. And we can see there on the OAEs um, in the higher frequencies there on the left ear that, that those OAEs are definitely reduced or absent in, in most of those. So as I mentioned earlier, it's a good confirmation that something's definitely going on in the cochlea for those patients where they have normal audiometry results. Now we're getting to the exciting part of the talk where we look at the protocols and the settings. Now, most of you are going to rely on a few different protocols to assess your patients with. And also most manufacturers equipment come with a handful of protocols ready for you to use. Luckily for us, for many of the OAE test parameters, large studies have provided us with which test parameters are optimal or the most appropriate for use. Now what's important as a clinician is that we recognize when a selected protocol is right for one patient, but maybe not for another, and also when we need to adjust certain parameters to obtain optimal test results. For example, if you're going to be measuring in a noisy environment, or you have a noisy patient, then your standard protocol may not be suitable as the noise could obliterate your OAE response. So it's therefore really important that you know how to adjust the protocol or the test method in order to quickly assess your patient appropriately. Now, before we jump into the details of protocol settings, I'd like to touch upon screening versus diagnostics. So what is the purpose of screening? As I've written here, the objective is to separate persons with an auditory disorder that will interfere with communication from those who do not have a communicatively important auditory disorder. Now this makes OAEs a great choice in newborn hearing screening, even though it doesn't test the entire auditory pathway. But basically with screening, our results are grouping our patients into one of two categories. So we have the pass category or the refer category. Now when the test says pass, this means that OAEs at a certain number of frequencies are present, let's say three out of four. And from this, we can assume that there is a significantly low chance that the patient has a significant auditory disorder that will require them to have some sort of amplification. Now with the refer category, all this tells us is that the detection criteria in the protocol wasn't met. It doesn't tell us why, particularly if we're using screening equipment that doesn't give information about the OAE or the noise levels. So all it tells us is the test environment could have been too noisy, the patient may have a hearing loss, could be permanent or transitional, for example, conductive hearing loss, or it could be due to poor test techniques. So categorizing our patients into one of two categories such as pass and refer is not necessarily going to be appropriate when we're doing diagnostic testing. Now in diagnostic testing, we're looking to get as much information as possible regarding the type, configuration, and the site of the auditory dysfunction. So is this DP gram here sufficient to help us? Well, it probably depends on the patient that we're testing. If I was testing a difficult three-year-old, then maybe yes. But if I was testing an adult complaining of tinnitus or reporting noise exposure, then probably not. In diagnostics, we're probably wanting to test a lot more frequencies than six where possible. 
And what's interesting about this one is that this is actually a recording from the same patient and ear, just using a different DP protocol. So this is just an example to show you how important it is to be able to select the right protocol so you can get the right information about your patient's cochlear status. So what are some best practice um, tips that we can use when we're doing diagnostics? Well, firstly, we shouldn't be using screening protocols. We need to be able to test a significant number of test frequencies. So probably four to six frequencies is gonna be in inadequate when we're testing diagnostically. Um, some authors suggest that repeating the test is a good way to improve our confidence in the result. And this is something that um, many clinicians do. It's very typical in ABR testing as well. So we can always repeat our result if we're uncertain of in our confidence in the test result. Now we need to make sure that we have low noise levels because the OAE response is related a lot to the noise level in the recording. So we need to record for long enough to get low noise. And we shouldn't be categorizing our OEs as pass refer. There's three categories that we can categorize them as, and we'll talk about that later. We should conduct OEs on appropriate patients. So um, there's obviously going to be some patients where it's appropriate and others that aren't, um, but testing on no one also isn't going to be very helpful. And finally, we shouldn't assume anything. So just because the audiogram is abnormal, um, we don't want to just say, well, probably this patient doesn't have OAEs. By doing an OAE test, we may be able to pick up the difference between a sensory neural um, versus a retrocochlear pathology um, issue. So which protocol should we use? Now, this is going to be very dependent upon what the purpose of the test is, who our patient is, are they an adult or a child, and also what the test environment is like. Is it a quiet testing booth that we're testing in or are we testing in a little bit more noisy environment where we may need to change our, our protocol or some settings in the protocol? Now, if we look at the display of the results, it's really important in diagnostic testing that we can see some certain information on the test screen. So things like the amplitude of the OAE, we wanna be able to see that. We wanna see the frequencies that we're, we're testing we also want to be able to see some normative data if we have some, that's going to help us with our analysis. If we can set up the system to give us a check mark when an OAE has been detected based on the detection criteria, that's also going to be very helpful. And we also want to be able to see the noise floor in our recording. So that's going to help us knowing when to stop testing when our noise floor is low enough. And finally, we want to be able to see the minimum OAE level, which you can see marked there at minus 10 on this graph. Now, in some equipment, you may not be able to see that, but you should, you should know what the minimum OAE level is that you're going to accept uh, when you're doing your analysis. And the minimum OAE is typically set to the stimulus level minus 80 dB SPL. So if you're stimulating um, at 65, 55, then your um, minimum OAE level is going to be around, let's say, minus 15. And some people choose to bump it up to around minus 10 just to be sure that what we're, what we're detecting as an OAE is definitely from the ear and it's not some sort of artifact, stimulus artifact from the, from the hardware. Now, all systems will have some sort of system artifact or distortion and you can actually test for that by placing your probe in a, in a test cavity that's provided by the manufacturer and running a test until the noise floor is extremely low, let's say around minus 20, minus 25 dB SPL. And that's gonna give you an indication as to the level of system distortion. And therefore you should set your minimum OAE level above that. Now in some software, you'll be able to see the probe check graph, which is gonna be very useful before, during and after testing. So this may give you an indication as to whether the probe is in the ear properly, whether it's the probe's leaking, falling out of the ear, and also whether it's blocked. Um, and in some cases, you'll actually be able to see a correlation of the probe check before and after testing that will give you a good indicator of whether the probe remained in the ear during the test. Now on a lot of test screens, you'll also be able to see some test summary information. And it's really important that you do have this on your test screen so that you can get an overview quickly of the, the test details, the, the test settings that were used. 
and also some information about the different frequencies tested, the, the DP levels, the noise levels, the signal to noise ratio, and you've also got your reliability percentage there and a check mark next to the DPs, the frequencies that were detected. And of course, having all that information available is going to be important when you're trying to interpret your results. So which frequency should we be testing? So we know the F2 is our test, um, main test frequency that we're referring to. And the range that we should be testing is going to very much depend on the patient and the test environment. Now, most equipment can test between about 500 hertz and 12,000 hertz. And in most cases, it's going to be difficult recording OAEs below about one kilohertz due to just due to noise reasons. If, we're, if you have a patient where they have maybe suspected noise-induced hearing loss, then the 2 to 6 kilohertz region is going to be um, important for testing. And if your patient has, um, is receiving ototoxic drugs, then you want to be testing the higher frequencies as high as you can go uh, because those are the ones that are going to be damaged first. Now, how many frequencies then should we be testing? Well, the number of frequencies per octave, again, is going to depend on the patient that you're seeing. If you're seeing a, a small child, maybe um, testing, you know, 20, 25 DP points is going to be challenging. Um, if you're testing an adult that can sit quietly for 30 to 40 seconds, then you could be testing, for example, somewhere between three to eight frequencies per octave. So with patients that have maybe suspected noise-induced hearing loss or um, for ototoxic monitoring, we want to test more frequencies per octave. Um, and obviously, depending on that patient compliance, then we may need to reduce that number. So which F2, F1 ratio are we going to use? Well, this has pretty much been determined by a lot of research that's been done. And we know that the most clinically effective F2, F1 ratio for testing patients across all age groups is somewhere between 1.20 and 1.23. And the research shows that 1.22 is going to give us the most robust DPOE res results. So that's the one that we would typically use in order to determine our F1 test frequency. Now, what about stimulus levels? We're using two different stimuli when we're testing with DPOEs. So we need to actually set an L1, a level one, and also a level two. Now, there are three different intensity relationships that we can choose from. So there's one where L1 is less than L2. Now, this produces suboptimal DPOE responses, so it's rarely used in clinical practice. So we can strike that one off the list. There's the L1 equaling L2, so both our stimuli would be presented at the same level. Now this does produce consistently robust DPOEs, um, and it's been used clinically until around the 90s. Now using an L1 equaling L2 is appropriate when we're using higher stimulus levels, for example 75 dB SPL. The one we use generally today in clinic is where L1 is greater than L2. And this is because it consistently produces robust DPOEs. The amplitudes are typically 3 dB larger than the L1 equaling L2 relationship. And it also provides an enhanced sensitivity to cochlear dysfunction. So typically we're probably going to be testing using an L1 of 65 and an L2 of 55 dB SPL. And what we can do is if we want to be um, have a higher test sensitivity, we can actually decrease those intensity levels. Now, in terms of test time, we're probably going to be testing for around 30 seconds or longer, but it's going to depend very much on the number of frequencies that we're testing and also how noisy the test environment or the patient is. So what I usually recommend is that you set a long test time in your protocol and then manually stop the test when your noise floor is low. Now, here's an example here where um, test same test on the same patient, but due to a lot of noise in the recording, we, we haven't got any check marks there on that graph on the left hand side um, because the noise levels were too high. So it is really important with OAEs that we do average for long enough to get a low noise floor. And normally we should be able to get our noise flo floor down around minus 20 dB SPL. And then we can be fairly certain that the responses that we're seeing on the test screen are true and accurate. 
In terms of stimulus tolerance, uh, some software you may be able to set a stimulus tolerance value. And what that does is it actually defines a range that the stimulus must be presented in. So for example, if we set a stimulus tolerance of 3 dB, this would indicate that the stimulus um, must be presented within 3 dB, either 3 dB higher or 3 dB lower than that tolerance value. Now, the reason that we want to have this stimulus tolerance setting is that we want to ensure that we're not overstimulating the ear, which can lead to artifact responses. And of course, we also don't want to be stimulating at too low a level because then we're also going to be getting inaccurate results. Changes in the stimulus level are usually going to occur due to probe placement in the ear canal. So if the probe is moving during testing, um, your stimulus is not going to be able to be as accurate. So it's really important to get a good probe fit before testing and also instructing the patient to remain still during the test. Now, what about our noise rejection level or our artifact rejection? So our artifact rejection level, it's going to determine which sweeps or data are included or excluded from the recording due to noise. And noise can be both ambient um, from the room, for example, from the environment, or, or also physiologic from the patient. And so we need to set a suitable cutoff to ensure that our results are not going to be contaminated by the noise. So um, the more noise in the recording, um, the longer our test time is going to be, and we don't want that. So firstly, what can we do about noise that's not related to our protocol setting? Well, first of all, in terms of ambient noise, we can try to get rid of as many noise sources in our test environment as possible. We can make sure that we have a good tight and deep probe fit. Uh, we can move the patient away from any OAE equipment or any noisy equipment in the test room. And then, of course, we may need to modify our test settings um, if, if we've done everything we can um, aside from that. And secondly, with our patient noise, we can obviously provide an adequate instruction to the patient about sitting quietly, um, trying not to breathe too heavily during the test so that there's no extra noise um, from the patient in the recording. So if we have a look at averaging and the noise rejection level, of course, we can't record an OE without recording noise. But with averaging techniques, the OAE can be separated from the noise. And this is due to the fact that the OAE is stable while the noise is random. So in every sample of data, there's going to be OAE and noise. And over time, due to the averaging, that noise is reduced, allowing us to see that there's a response there and, and give that response a check mark and say, yes, it's detected. So if we only average for a short amount of time, we may not see that the response is there, even though it actually is. Now, finding the optimum noise rejection level can be very difficult. Um, if we set it too low, we'll only actually record a very few number of samples, um, which is going to prolong our test time. While if we set it too high, the average is going to be contaminated by noise, which is also going to increase our test time. And one thing that we can use to overcome this is weighted averaging. So let's have a look at what traditional averaging is, and then I'll talk about weighted averaging. So with traditional averaging, there's a couple of assumptions. First is that noise is constant during the recording and that the noise is low. And we know in OAE testing, that's not always the case. The patient moves, um, someone starts talking in the background or slams a door. Um, and it, the other assumption is, is that we need to set a strict noise rejection criteria. Now, this means that Traditionally, we may need longer test times, and it can also increase the chance of false refers. So that means we may not detect the true OAE response, and that can lead to misdiagnosis of the patient. So with traditional averaging, we're going to be setting our rejection level, and we typically would set this a little more strictly in order to reduce excessive noise. And so there's our rejection level, and as each sweep or data sample is collected, we can categorize that as very good. Um, it's below the rejection level, so we'll accept it. This next one here has a lot of noise. Um, it's barely acceptable, but it's, it's under the rejection level, so we will um, accept that one too. And this one here is very noisy. It's above the rejection level, so it's going to get rejected. 
And what we do is we treat all sweeps or data samples equally. So they either get 100% in the average or they get 0% in the average. Now with weighted averaging or Bayesian weighted averaging in this example, what we can actually do is we can set our rejection level a little bit higher. So that's good because we're not going to be rejecting as many sweeps as before. So if we take our three sweeps or data samples before, then what we're going to do is we're going to weight those according to the amount of noise. So those that have a small amount of noise get a high weight in the averaging and those with a high amount of noise get a low weight in the averaging. And we can see our third one there, it's, um, it was rejected previously, but now it's accepted. So we're not going to be throwing out as many sweeps, which is also going to help us. So the benefit of, of using weighted averaging when you're recording OAEs is that less sweeps will get rejected. Um, intermittent noise is not going to contaminate the recording and it will generally mean you have a faster test time. Now, in order to show this, um, I want to just present a small study here that we did in-house. Um, this was collected by our R&D department and this was collected on TEOEs um, using a research system. So what we did was we recorded 33 ears um, in a noisy office test environment and we also asked the patients to generate lots of patient noise during the testing. Now this graph here just gives you an, an overview of what the results of the study were. Now we can see here um, along, along this axis we've got the, the frequencies that were tested and here we have the signal to noise ratio improvement that was gained by using Bayesian weighting. So if we look here at the one kilohertz band, we actually had a SNR improvement of around five and a half dB. Um, at 1.5 kilohertz, it was around four dB and at two kilohertz around three dB. So what the results showed were that the Bayesian weighting was particularly beneficial at the lower frequencies, which you can see there. Um, if we look at the four kilohertz band, um, we didn't see much of an SNR improvement there with the Bayesian weighting. But if we look at two kilohertz, there was that three dB SNR increase, which actually equates to about half the test time needed compared to traditional averaging methods. And overall, um, with all the tests that were conducted, there was approximately a 50% reduction in test time. So if you look at the table down here, we can see time to a 6 dB SNR. With Bayesian on, the mean test time was around 15 seconds, whereas with traditional averaging, it was around 32 seconds. So which noise rejection level are you going to set? Well, that's very much going to depend on whether traditional or weighted averaging is used in the detection algorithm. So if traditional averaging is used, you are going to need to set a lower rejection level. Um, whereas if weighted averaging is used, then it would need to be a higher level. In DPOE, DPOE testing, um, a typical noise rejection setting is around 30 dB SPL. The presence or absence of an OE response is going to be determined by a combination of mathematical algorithms, some averaging techniques, and also the, the stopping or detection criteria. So various stopping criteria, such as the signal to noise ratio, residual noise, the minimum OAE level, a reliability percentage, and also test time are used in conjunction in order to determine when uh, DP is detected and also when the test will be stopped. So if we look at each of these, so our signal to noise ratio is our difference between the OAE amplitude and our noise level. Um, next we have residual noise and in some protocols what you can do is you can set it up to say well if my residual noise, if my noise level is very low in the recording and it hasn't already detected an OAE then I don't want to continue testing at that frequency. So here at 4 kilohertz the noise was down at around minus 20. It's very unlikely that if an OAE was present it wouldn't have already been detected so there's no point continuing testing at that frequency. We also have our minimum OAE level here, which we talked about earlier. So we want to be sure that our DPOAE is above that line to be detected as a true OAE. We also have reliability, which I'll talk about shortly, and also our test time. So if, if we do set a maximum test time of, let's say, one minute, no matter what, the test is going to stop after that, that time is up.
So what's this reliability percentage? So the reliability percentage is a calculation that the algorithm uses to determine how likely it is that the OAE is actually from the ear and not just part of the noise. Now, in traditional analysis of OAEs, we're generally looking at the difference between the OAE level and the noise level. And clinicians often consider a signal to noise ratio of 6 dB as significant and translate that into an OAE being present and thus out of hair cell being okay. But we need to be cautious about this for two reasons. The first reason is that the noise level is an average, noise fluctuates, and in some cases the OAE can just be an accidental peak of the noise. The second reason is that the, the traditional 6 dB SNR finds its origin in newborn hearing screening. Now, test protocols in this area usually require a very high sensitivity of, let's say, around 99.9%. .9%. As more than one frequency is generally tested, let's say three out of four for a pass, then a 6 dB at three out of four frequencies provides that sensitivity, that high sensitivity, that the pass result reflects a true measurement of real OAEs. Now, if we were to change that screening protocol to, let's say, only two out of four required for a pass, then we would need to increase our, our SNR probably to around eight or nine dB in order to keep the same level of test, overall test sensitivity. Now in diagnostics, we're actually assessing individual frequencies. So a 6 dB SNR may not be sufficient in being certain that the response is actually from the cochlea. So this is where the reliability percentage comes in. If we have a look here, um, if we look at this example here, we have an OAE where we have a very large signal to noise ratio, which is great, and we have a very high reliability percentage number there of 99.99%. Um, and if we look at the, the OAE spectrum, we can see that the, the OAE is definitely well above the average noise level, and we're fairly certain there that it's not part of the noise. Um, if we look at this example here, here's a case where the signal to noise ratio was 6.5 dB. So traditionally we would say that's, that's an OAE, we've met our 6 dB SNR, we'll give this one a check mark. But in terms of reliability, we can only be 79.673% certain that it is actually a true OAE. And if we look at the, um, the noise spectrum here, it's very difficult to say that, that that OAE is definitely well above the noise level. Now with that DP reliability percentage, there's actually a one in five chance that this OAE is just part of the noise. So about a 20% about a chance that it's not a true OAE. And I think in diagnostics, we wanna be more certain about our results. So which setting can we use in the protocol to be sure of our test results? Well, we can set we can set our reliability setting to, for example, 98%. And for each ear tested, that, that's basically going to say that there's a 1 in 50 chance that the OAE is not true for, for the frequencies tested on that ear. Whereas if we set our reliability setting to 99.99%, then it's more like a 1 in 10,000 chance that the OAE is not true. So the higher the reliability percentage, the higher confidence we can have that the result is a true OAE response. And I think in diagnostics, we wanna be fairly certain because we're making some, some fairly um, detailed conclusions about the patient's hearing. I mentioned repeatability earlier. Uh, in some cases, you may like to repeat the test if you're unsure that it is definitely a true response from the ear. And by using an overlay function, you can be fairly certain there that those OEs were true because they were repeatable on that patient. And finally, um, the last setting that we can adjust in the protocol, if your system allows for testing um, pressurized OAE, then we can make a decision whether we want to test at ambient pressure or at peak pressure. So should we be testing at ambient or peak pressure? Now, if the patient has any sort of negative or positive um, pressure in the middle ear, this is going to reduce the OAE amplitude. And the reason for that is, is that it's going to make it slightly more difficult for the stimulus to go through the middle ear and reach the cochlea, and vice versa for that OAE to, to travel back through the middle ear to our probe where we can record the response. 
Now, if we look at the effects of pressure on the middle ear, here's an example from the wideband absorbance graph. And we can see here that this patient had some negative pressure of minus 53 DARPA. And if we look at that blue curve, we can see that when the test, the absorbance test was done pressurized, we get a much um, better absorbance of the stimulus through the ear than if we ran that test at ambient pressure. So we know that the middle ear pressure actually increases the stiffness of the ear system um, it, and it does impede those responses, particularly below two kilohertz. In some cases, we may also see an increase in the higher frequency response. Now this study here was done um, by Zebian and colleagues in 2013 and what they did was they looked at the effects of middle ear pressure on OAE amplitudes. So they tested 12 otologically normal individuals and what they did was they changed the pressure um, applied to the ear between minus 200 and plus 200 DARPA in 50 DARPA steps. And what we can see on these graphs very clearly is that as the pressure moved away from, from ambient pressure, the amplitude of the OAEs decreased both with positive and negative pressure. So in this study, on average, the, there was a decrease of around 2.3 dB of OAE um, amplitude per 50 DARPA for the lower and higher pressures. So this is actually quite significant and um, it, it definitely shows good reasoning for doing pressurized testing. So how do we do that? So this is just a case study here um, to show you the effects of pressurization um, on, on one particular subject. So this patient here had um, pressure of minus 167 DARPA. And when we tested the ear just at ambient pressure, then we can see here that the, um, that the OAE amplitudes are quite reduced here below two kilohertz. Whereas when we pressurized the ear, so we, we basically aligned the pressure to um, ensure that the, there was much better absorbance through the middle ear. We can see here that the, with the blue curve that the OAE amplitudes increase quite significantly when we pressurize the ear during testing. And what was nice to see in this particular example was that when, the, when this subject's middle ear returned to normal again, so they, they had a normal tympanogram again, then the OAE results that were recorded during pressurized testing matched quite nicely with the true OAE during normal middle ear function. And if you'd like to know more about um, this particular case study and pressurized testing, there is an article link there that you can take a look at. The, the Academy has also done another presentation on pressurized OAE specifically, which highlights um, the benefits. And there's also a selected publications document that you can download. Um, there's lots of research published on this area um, if you'd like to know more. So we're, we're finally at the analysis and reporting section. So we're getting to the end of this webinar. Um, in this section, I'm going to be talking about how you can analyze your OE test results. And in diagnostics, the categorization of OE findings as present or absent, which are commonly used in hearing screening, pass or refer, is not really adequate for diagnostic applications. So we would typically um, analyze and report our results into one of three categories. So OEs can either be present and normal, and this means that the amplitudes are within a defined normal region, and that's where we use some normative data to determine that. We would also say that the OE is either present but abnormal, and this is when the OE has been detected, um, but the amplitudes are reduced and outside the normal range. And finally, in some cases, our OEs are not going to be present, um, and this indicates an absent of OEs. So if we look at this DP gram here, um, we've got our OAE responses. Uh, this shaded area here is our normative data that was collected on this instrument. And we can see all these OAE um, DPOEs that were sitting up here in the normal range, in the normative range, we would, we would indicate that those OAEs were present and normal. Now we have another um, OAE point here at six kilohertz. It was detected by the algorithm as being present, but it falls outside that normal range. So we would indicate that, that at six kilohertz, the OAE was present, but abnormal or reduced. 
And then we have some OAEs that um, were not detected and they fell below that um, minimum OAE level and we would say that they were absent. Um, and we should be careful about reporting on OAEs where the noise floor is, is very high. So probably in this case, we can't say too much about 500 hertz because we didn't average for long enough there to, to really be sure of what the response is. Now, in terms of normative data, there's actually two different ways that you can use normative data. Um, in a lot of systems, if we go back to this example here, this, this normative data shows um, the normal amplitudes um, for a range of patients that was collected. Um, and if the DP points falls within that normative gray shaded area, then we would say that they're present, of norm present and normal. Now, if you use the Boys Town data, the way that they've done their graph is a little bit differently. So in, in, this, in this case, this is the Boys Town data here, and DPOEs that are above this shaded area are consistent with normal outer hair cell function and normal audiometric thresholds at a 95% confidence level. Now, results in the gray area are literally in the gray area and are inconclusive. So that, that's where this overlap of patients is that, that may have normal hearing or they may have a hearing loss. So um, we need to be careful when we're analysing our OAE results based on normative data that we know which type of normative data that we're using. Um, and finally here, any, any OAEs that would be below that grey shaded area, then they're consistent with a hearing loss at a 95% confidence level. Now, when we're also doing our analysis, there's some other things that we can consider, things like the stimulus level. Now, we did set that in our protocol, but we do want to be sure that the probe did actually output the correct stimulus level during testing. And so if any of your results look a bit strange or you're not 100% not certain, what you can do is you can actually look at the L1 and L2 levels that were presented during testing just to be certain that, that they were... Um, they were what you expected those stimulus levels to be. So if, if they were way off by 5 or 10 dB, then you should be cautious about how you're analysing those results and you probably should retest um, that ear again. Um, we talked earlier about the minimum OAE level, so here's, here's a good reason to use, use this level. We can see here that even though we have quite a significant signal-to-noise ratio there, um, if, if we're unsure whether system distortion can occur below that level, then we need to be careful in, in saying that those are true OEs from the ear. Um, we've talked about reliability. Um, and again, here's an example where the OAE was not yet detected. Um, even though the signal to noise ratio was extremely high there at 15.1, the reliability was only 94%. So if we wanted to be more certain around the 99% um, percent mark, then we would need to average for a bit longer at that frequency so that we could be sure that it was, was a true OAE. Now I covered a lot of ground today in this webinar, starting with a short overview of anatomy and physiology and some assumptions about when the OAEs may be present or absent. And this also included the effects of the outer and middle ear on obtaining OAE measurements, which are important aspects to remember even though the OAE is generated from the cochlea. I also shared some suggestions about the many patient groups and situations where OAEs can provide some extremely beneficial information to help form a diagnostic conclusion about your patient's hearing. Now, I know the section about protocol settings could have been a bit overwhelming. Luckily for a lot of these settings, we don't need to, to change them too much due to extensive research that tells us um, the best option that we should use. And for many, many of you, your equipment would have come with, with protocols that you'll be able to use in most cases. Um, there are, however, a few settings such as, for example, the test time, the rejection level and some stopping criteria such as the signal to noise ratio or the reliability percentage that you can play with to improve your measurements and have more confidence in your diagnosis. And lastly, um, I've presented some very good guidelines that you can use about how to correctly analyse DPOE measurements and in using normative data. So I hope you've all enjoyed the presentation today and that you've been able to take something away from it. 
if you want to do some further reading um, about OAEs, these are some great references and suggested readings that I can recommend to you. And thank you very much for listening today.